to the University of Finley Art and Culture Show. I am Sharenda Welton, your host, and we have with us on set today, Mr. Ethan Fisher. Ethan, welcome. Hey, Sharenda, how are you? I'm doing great. It's so wonderful to have you here. This has been in the plans for a little over a year, yep. so it's wonderful to have you here and on the set. We had the opportunity to meet in Florida, but that is not home for you. Nope. You are a Colorado guy. Yes. So welcome to Ohio. The cold here is not affecting you, I'm sure. No, it's not. A little yeah. bit more humid. L a little more rain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Driving in the rain yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of it. Yeah. Yep. So, and you were with us uh, not only to chat here on set, mm. but you're also on a national tour right now. Yes. And before we go any farther, we do want to share with the audience that some of the content of today's uh, interview may be challenging and difficult to listen to. So if you have younger ones under the age of 13, or you maybe um, aren't ready to start having conversations with your children about substance abuse, this might be a good time to encourage them to go color someplace or be on the Game Boy or Xbox. Because the content of today's interview is gonna be a little bit heavier. And I want to thank you for trusting myself yep. with your story. Yep. And uh, your story began in college. Yes, it began in college. The but story that you share on your national tour, that's kind of where it starts. Uh, actually, it starts in middle school. Okay. So okay. that's where I, I really start my story with audiences okay. is that middle school is such a critical point. Mm -hmm. So parents, if you are having struggles with your kids talking about this in the middle school, this is actually great for them to see and witness because we tend to want to avoid those situations when we have younger kids, younger kids. Mm -hmm. but I'm seeing it younger and younger where we're having drugs and mental health issues in not only middle school kids, but we're having it in sixth grade, fifth mm -hmm. grade, and it's scary. It is. It's, so It's very sad. And my job is to make people aware of this mm -hmm. and make them understand that it's okay to talk about it mm -hmm. because, it, like what you just said, parents don't know how to address this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if we can address it early then maybe we save them from a lifelong issue of battling depression anxiety uh, what a lot of people do drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. and they mask their issues with that mm -hmm. so my job is to open that dialogue okay yeah so you begin with middle school yep. and uh, the choices that were made in middle school impacted high school Yes. Impacted university, yep. impacted the rest of your life. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about the title of your presentation, Undrafted Consequences, mm -hmm. and the, con the word consequences, the C and the O and the N are all capitalized, and that's done on purpose. Yes. And so share with us a little bit about how that is. Um, you know, when I look at undrafted consequences and I see that capital C, capital O, capital N, before I ever heard you present, the first thing I thought was, ooh, I want to hear what he has to say because there are so many cons out there working to um, take down some barriers and some protection walls so that kids and young adults and even adults in general feel safe and feel like it's not going to happen to them. And that's not just one specific con, that's multiple cons that are messages. That was my interpretation yeah. when I first read the title of your presentation. Yeah. Uh, what was your motivation behind the undrafted consequences? So life consequences is based off of multiple things. Mm -hmm. It's the choices and decisions we all make each and every day. We tend to make choices not thinking that there's going to be a future consequence. And as a college student, I was dealing with mental health and drugs and alcohol and college basketball and making all these choices that I didn't realize was going to have a consequence to it. Mm -hmm. And in my case, my consequence was a con, as in convict. So my choices and decisions led me to be a convict. And that is why the CON is highlighted, because the choices and decisions that you and I make each every, every day, we don't think that it's going to put us in a position of getting in trouble with the law, getting in trouble with our work establishment, our bosses, our employees, our coaches, our coaches. 
And you never think about that, especially as a, you know, 20, 21 year old college student. I was never thinking about that. I was just thinking about how am I going to play basketball? Where's my next school? I didn't realize that drunk driving was going to put me in a prison system. Mm -hmm. And that's where the con came from. Okay. So it encompasses your choices and decisions, but it encompasses a whole lot bigger in the sense of these are the consequences to my actions. I have to deal with it for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And that is a major consequence. And your family and your wife and anyone that comes into your life, it becomes part of what yes. they're dealing with also. Yes. yes. They have to either accept it or they're not going to be around long. Yes. So I think we've talked about this with my wife. Mm -hmm. The first couple dates we went on, she didn't want to pursue it any further mm -hmm. because I had a felony on my record. I was coming out of prison. And she looked at me on paper and said, bad dude, bad dude. <laughs> and it took me a lot of begging mm -hmm. and knowing that I had to show her that I was a good human being mm -hmm. and that what I did was a mistake. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of <laughs> coercing and showing her that I was a positive person. And, you know, she, the speaking and helping students, that's great. But she needed to see it at home she in need, everyday life. Yeah. And she that it was consistent. Consistent. And, you know, just breaking down all the things that she didn't realize I still couldn't do as a felon. Mm -hmm. This is the first year I've ever voted. I know, and I'm so, so excited for you and thrilled for you. And, and I, That's it was, a big deal. It was a big deal. Yeah. They've and, been covering that a lot on NPR, interviewing different people in different states yep. that were in systems and penal institutions yep. and, and the challenges that they faced even though it's legal in their state, the yep. challenges they face to get to the point where they can actually stand in line to yep. vote. Yep. It, uh, you know, th that's a part of the whole consequences. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a felon now. Mm -hmm. There are jobs, there are careers that I can't have. Mm -hmm. I've got a finance degree. Mm -hmm. I can't work in, in, a, finance, pub in yeah. a publicly traded company that trades on the stock exchange. Mm -hmm. It's against the SEC rules. Mm -hmm. And you don't think about that as a middle school, a high school, or a college student. Mm -hmm. I love the finance world. Mm -hmm. As soon as I got that as my degree, I was like, oh, I want to work in, in high finance, and I want to trade stock, and I want to do all this. We're sorry, Mr. Fish, we won't hire you for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not feeling sorry for yourself. No. You're just acknowledging that yep. these, are, these are consequences these are consequ that I'm dealing with. Yep. Um, and so, Let's talk about in college because you were you were not just an athlete that enjoyed intramurals. You were starting lineup college basketball star. Yes. 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 And uh, chemicals got in the way of things, and you received scholarships and you received calls and you went to how many different universities? Uh, <laughs> I mean, because it's a lot. It's oh, yeah. yeah. It's not. One, there were many involved. I went to five different colleges for college basketball. Mm -hmm. um, and in each one, it was substance, alcohol, abuse that caused you to move on. Yep. So now that I've been doing all this speaking, it, it made me reflect on why was I doing all that. And a part of college is everybody drinks and thinks it's social and fun. Well, for me, that's how it started the social and the fun and, and meeting people. But what people didn't realize and what I didn't realize was that I was hiding and masking my depression and my suicidal ideations all the way from middle school. Mm -hmm. So I was using alcohol as a coping mechanism. And then soon as I would hit a obstacle or roadblock, I would quit. And I would go to the alcohol even more than the last school. And for somebody to get five college basketball opportunities, I, I'm not saying I'd play in the NBA, mm -hmm. but to have that many opportunities, it, it showed I had a lot of potential. Talent, talent yes. And, and I threw it away. And, right. And, and you're not, again, blaming the institutions. Nope. You're not saying it's their fault because they didn't see nope. a problem. Nope. But you're saying you had five different opportunities that you could have gotten yourself cleaned up, yep. and you didn't you didn't go looking for answers, and you didn't know who to ask for help if you even acknowledged nope that there was a problem. So you're in college five or college six? Which one was it? Was it the sixth or the fifth college? The sixth school is where I got my act together. Yes. 
So was it the fifth school that you made the decision yes. that, so do you feel comfortable talking oh, yeah. about that a little bit on yeah. camera? Okay, um, so tell us what that night looked like. So, or did it start that morning? So the night of my accident, mm -hmm. uh, it was 2003 and uh, I was in between schools. I was in between my fifth going on my sixth school and I lost my scholarship. I lost my opportunity to play. So I was living at my parents' house trying to get my act together. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been isolating a lot mm -hmm. that year. Mm -hmm. And so November of 2003, I got invited to a house party like most college students go to. Mm -hmm. And I went out with all my college buddies. And the night started as, hey, we're renting, or we're watching somebody's house. They have a hot tub. So come over. We're going to have all our girlfriends over. So it was a smaller get together, mm -hmm. but a house party. Just and they, a chillax time. A, a, exactly, mm -hmm. a chillax. Uh, we're going to have a, a wine and fondue party. I never drank wine before in my life. I was a hard alcohol. So when they said wine and fondue, I kind of like, I was like, no biggie. No biggie. Mm -hmm. So I remember going to the liquor store and, and picking up a bottle of Carlos Rossi because I listen to rap music. So that was in a lot of rap songs. So I, I picked that up and I went to the, the house party and I'll never forget. I remember like I drank three glasses really quick and my buddy was like, slow down fish slow down yeah um, this is gonna hit you and I remember just joking like I drink hard liquor this is tasting like I don't know it's like kiwi strawberry or yeah, something yeah and that's the last thing I remember um, the next thing I, I remember is I'm laying in a hospital bed and the nurses come in and the second nurse told me that I drunk drove and killed somebody and uh, but you, had you been in a coma or anything before that? I was in a blackout um, for 24 hours. Okay. So it wasn't a coma. Okay. But I drank, I had an alcohol content of 269. And I hit my head um, 72 miles an hour on the steering wheel. And don't remember any, I drove, I drove two miles down the wrong side of a four lane road with no tire on one side. And <clears throat> during sentencing, the, the cops played uh, the radio to the 911. Um, there's a lady on there that says, somebody please stop this white Suburban. There are sparks and flames coming from it. It's gonna hurt somebody. And then like two minutes later, I hit and kill um, Bill, who was the man in the car. Uh, so I have no recollection of anything that happened just what was in testimony. Well, it's in, and, and I've I've read, I've read the court documents hundreds of times. I had my parents drive me down that street multiple times after the accident. Trying to recall. To recall, and I can't, I can't remember anything from that night other than those three drinks. I can remember everything going up, and drinking that stuff, and my friends, and then from the the documents, they said I jumped into the hot tub with all my clothes on and started acting bizarre. Mm -hmm. And so we did a toxicology report. We did all this stuff trying to figure out what happened with me. And the only thing the toxicology lady could say was that amount of alcohol and then jumping into a hot tub only increases the level of drunkness that you are. Okay. So it, it, it totaled me. And what the documents say is I went downstairs to pass out and my friends that I was with, they knew that. Mm -hmm. That was one of my, when I drank and I get too drunk, you I passed out. Crash. I passed out in fields. I, I, I would avoid people because I don't like being around people mm -hmm. as is. So they already had a bed made for me. Mm -hmm. I went downstairs to pass out, I guess. They said they came to check on me. And I, I guess I opened up a basement window, crawled through the basement window, went through the garage and jumped into my car and took off. So I have no idea why or what caused triggered that, all that, triggered all that. Mm -hmm. And I've questioned almost every day of my life, I think about that moment and like, here's, so <clears throat> I don't know exactly where the house was, but all I know is as soon as I come out of that neighborhood, I have to take a left and go down a country road to my parents' house and there's two stoplights and it's maybe three and a half miles. From where you were for the get together. For the get together. Mm -hmm. For some reason that night, I took a right mm. straight into downtown Fort Collins. 
I was in between schools, so I didn't know where yeah, people were living. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where was I going. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying if I take a left, things end up differently, because I could have hit killed somebody on the way home. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I went right and went into the like most populous part of Fort Collins at that time in the morning. So I, I, my whole life, you know, you talk about choices. Even though I was blackout drunk, those choices led me to what happened. Mm -hmm. And now I'm dealing with that for, it's gonna be 16 years next month. Mm -hmm. And not a day goes by that I don't see those pictures, those images, um, I don't talk about it. it it's, and it's never gotten easier. Mm -hmm. And No, because it's, it's, you're keeping it alive. And in, in us visiting over the last year, part of the reason why you do that is specifically on choice, yep. because you don't ever want to forget Bill. No. And part of the life you're living, you're hoping you're living for Bill. Yep. And the courts have not mandated that, correct? No. That was not part of your sentencing. No. No. This is a decision that you have made in your process and in your healing and getting healthy mentally and physically yourself saying this is a message that I this is my call I have to share this message yep. and so Bill wasn't another college student how old was he when he died Bill was uh, 57 years old mm -hmm. and um, he he was married and a father correct he was married um, had a daughter and two grandchildren mm -hmm. and in my speech <clears throat> I talk about that, and that's usually where I start to lose it, mm -hmm. um, because I think about Bill and his family, and I think about my family in, in those moments when I'm standing on stage, and what happens if I lost my family to a drunk driver? Mm -hmm. um, you know, now it's really it really sucks because now I'm married, mm -hmm. and now I think about my wife, and I never wanted to be put in a position where I'd have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. And now I do every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about choices and decisions, this is a big piece of why I speak about the mental health now is because I wish I would have seen somebody back in eighth grade because then maybe my path of drugs and alcohol don't end up taking Bill's life. Mm -hmm. And that is something I have to live with. Like I, I have a whole entire sleeve dedicated to Bill and his family because I want to make sure that I prevent as many people from drunk driving as possible. But it's, it's something I didn't want to do at first because of, it's hard. Oh yeah. It's hard, but when I first did it and, and did it for a classroom project at a Front Range Community College, and I saw a bunch of 18, 19 year old students who couldn't look me in my face, that was the moment I decided like, Maybe there's something here I can do good with it. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until 2012 when I saw another keynote speaker speak about his drunk driving accident on, on campus and he killed three of his best friends. Mm -hmm. That was the moment I decided to do this job. Mm -hmm. Like I had no, zero intention of ever doing this. Mm -hmm. um, it just kind of happened. And when I saw, uh, I'm not gonna name his name, but when I saw That's him okay. speak, um, that was my life-changing moment of, I have to do something positive with this. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm here today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my, my story has taken on so much more than a drunk driving prevention, but that's the numero uno thing. Mm -hmm. That's everything that I try to do is to make people realize, whether you're a mom, a dad, a college student, a high school student, um, whether you're going to a New York, New York, or New Year's- Eve party. Uh, Eve party. Mm -hmm. Just drink once a year kind once of thing? Once you drink once a year, this can happen to you. Mm -hmm. And our society with alcohol, it's publicized on every single channel. Mm -hmm. It's on every single corner. Mm -hmm. But yet we have somebody die from drunk driving every hour. And 53 minutes, somebody's killed by a drunk driver. These are things that, as my job, I know I can try to prevent. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's the first time or 100th time. But these are why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Because if I can help save somebody's life and not put another family like Bill's through this, then, then I've done my job. Mm -hmm. Because when it comes down to it, 
every holiday, I think about Bill and his daughter and his wife and his grandkids, and they never have, they had never have a Christmas with him again. Mm-hmm. And it's because of me. And that's, that's, I don't want that to happen to anybody else. Because I have a family and I, I love my family to death and I don't want that happening to anybody and it can. Mm-hmm. It doesn't discriminate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's why I do what I do. That's my purpose, that's my passion, that's, I love my job. Mm-hmm. Um, every day that I'm not speaking, is, is a day that I feel like I'm not changing or saving somebody's life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've molded it into something I never imagined. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, um, I've turned a lot of bad into a lot of good, mm-hmm. but I can never forget what happened. Mm-hmm. And um, I tell people all the time, I, you know, I got this tattoo for Bill and it's his gravestone. Mm-hmm. And every day I brush my teeth and I see my arm in the mirror, it's, it's a constant reminder um, because that's the reality of my life because of my choices and decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all have choices. Mm-hmm. And so that happened between fifth and sixth college and you were sentenced and you went to prison. Yes. And while in prison, you made a decision that you were going to finish your college degree. Yep. And you did that. And um, when you were released from jail, uh, you went on back to the, the camp, back to the A campus, mm-hmm. and you tried out for something. Yeah. What'd you try out for? Uh, another basketball program. Mm-hmm. Now you weren't 18. You came out of co- or you came out of prison, and how old were you? 28. Mm-hmm. And there was something in you that said, I still, I still have something here mm-hmm. to share. Because you're a team player. Mm-hmm. Uh, you isolated yourself, but you, you want to be with that team. Yeah. You identify with that. Yeah. And when we've talked about your workout routines and everything, you are definitely a team member. Yep. Yep. And so, I mean, there had to have been a lot of whispering in your head. What are you doing? You're 28 years old. Look, you're a screw up. Why, why even try? And, and then, you know, in prison, I'm sure that you had some assistance with mental health issues, but probably not a whole lot, I'm guessing. So you still were processing and maybe at this time still torturing yourself in how to compartmentalize everything. And you did what? Well, I, I went back to school, but with prison and mental health, the, the reality was I didn't have a lot of help. Mm-hmm. But when you're in prison, you don't have, uh, you don't have time or an opportunity to, f- to feel bad or sorry about yourself because you have to protect yourself and you have to like, make sure you're, you're strong because if anybody sees weakness, they take advantage of you. And so I yeah, cause knew- because you were in maximum security. You weren't at in- At first, yeah. at first, and then I worked my way down. And, the, I fought fires, I took college courses while I was in prison, and I did all those things to lessen my prison sentence mm-hmm. um, because they give you opportunities to better yourself. It's just a lot of men that go to prison and women, they, they don't, give up on themselves. They give up, mm-hmm. and they sit in those cells and they watch TV every day and they go to the yard and they work out, but they don't try to better themselves. Mm-hmm. And DOC gives you programs, they're not the best. But they give you oppor- opportunities to better yourself or do something. And DOC stands for Department of yeah, Corrections. Department of Corrections. And so I took everything that they gave me and tried to build myself. So when I got out of prison, I had the tools to become a, a, a person in, in civilization and society that was productive. Mm-hmm. And So you weren't going to give up on yourself. No. You had made mistakes that looked like you were leading that way, but you made a decision that said... No, I, I now have something to live for. You didn't know exactly what it was, no. but you knew you needed to live yep. and be productive. And so I, I always say this, basketball is probably outside of God. Basketball is probably the biggest thing that's ever kept me alive. So basketball helped me through all that depression, all that suicidal stuff as a teen. And, and then when I got out of prison, it was there for me to go back and play at 28. And, and you didn't just go back and sit on the line and get called in. You, you made the starting lineup. Yeah, yeah I started, um, they went from 5 and 20 to 
three national tournament appearances, and I didn't even get to travel. So my first year, I only played in 13 games out of 33 because I couldn't leave Denver County because mm -hmm. I was still an inmate mm -hmm. on inmate status. So I had parole officers come in to my home games. Making sure you were where you were supposed yep. to be. And I had nine, at, well, it, at first it was a nine o'clock curfew and a 6 a.m. curfew. So I couldn't go to late games. I couldn't go to late practices because I had a 9 p.m. curfew. So I couldn't leave my house. I couldn't do any of that stuff. And, every, and here's the thing people, when you talk about consequences, any person that lived with me had to have background checks. They had to be um, in our house. They had to abide by no alcohol. They had to have rules. They couldn't have people over. So I couldn't even have people that weren't background checked into my house. So my roommates and my brother that lived with So the with school me. was really committed to what they saw in your talent yep. to oh, yeah. make it possible for you to be on that team. Yep. Um, if it wasn't for coach, I, he was the only coach in the country that would take me. And, and may we know the coach's name? Yes, Coach Culver. He is the head coach now at University of Colorado Springs. If it wasn't for Coach Culver, I, I wouldn't be doing this job today because he was the only coach in the country that was willing to take a chance on me. And I joke sometimes and it's like, well, he kind of needed to because they were so bad. <laughs> um, but if it wasn't for him and his leadership and taking the chance and risk for me, I wouldn't have had this amazing life that I have now. And it's because of him, it's because of my, my best friend, Nate Lark, and all my teammates at Johnson & Weld because they sacrificed their life for me. They didn't, like I say it all the time, like their leading scorer, their captain, all that stuff. I didn't get to travel with them. So they would lose on the road and then they'd come home and we had like a, a you know, 80% win streak at home. We very rarely lost at home, but they sacrificed for me. And so I've always said that I'd sacrifice for any one of them because they put their lives, their career um, in jeopardy because of their teammate. Mm -hmm. Like I had guys on the team that would have to drive me to UAs and BAs every day. So and what does UA and BA uh, stand so for? So a, a urine analysis and a breathalyzer. Mm -hmm. Every day I had yeah, to take those. Yeah, because you couldn't drive. I couldn't drive. And the nearest BA place was like five or seven miles away. Mm -hmm. So, so if you I were couldn't, either walking it or? Pedaling. Pedaling, yeah. I bike in between classes. Yeah. Um, and when I could, my teammates would give me a ride. But but I also didn't want to ask them to do that because it took you out of time. On I wasn't them. dependent. Right. So I pedaled again, still a lot. taking responsibility oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. for your decisions. Oh, yeah. But this time around, you had a team supporting you yep. and seeing the decisions that you had made and the consequences you were play, paying. Excuse yep. me, and they were saying, "Brother, we're here to support yep. you." And Maybe it was easier for some of them to live in a drug-free, alcohol-free home because it was a reality check for yep. them. Yep. And, and they didn't have to say it. They could just make those decisions and move on. Yep. And it was, it was, what was really cool about those guys, they, they respected it. Um, sure. And they knew I was older, and they'd jet, laugh at and crack jokes at me. Oh, yeah, I got <laughs> Gramps. Older. They called me Grandpa so uh -huh, many times. Uh -huh. I still get called Papa Fish every once yeah. in a while. Um, but... Uh, they uh, they accepted me and and they sacrificed for me and and it was it was a it was you know one of those moments in, in your life where it was just it couldn't have gone any other way like it was for me it was kind of like a Cinderella story because um, it was the only school in the country I could go to mm -hmm. because of my parole mm -hmm. and being an inmate and it just happened to be the coach that was at my last school and like nothing it, it just everything came together other, everything came together and it for me it's you know i i dwell on those memories because it was so important to me it, well they were the miracles that made it possible yes. for you to start the forgiveness process of your for yourself but also to be able to create a relationship with bill's memory so that's Pretty incredible. Yeah. So you did earn a degree in yes. college. Yep. And um, in addition to that, you put together some competition material 
Uh, tell us a little bit about that because it wasn't just on the court that you were a serious student yeah. now. You were doing some pretty intense moving and shaking in the classroom also. Yeah. And again, this is not uh, us talking about it to brag about it, but this is us talking about it. So if there's a viewer out there that needs to know this is possible, yes. uh, they're hearing it from someone who had to daily make the decision to fight to do what you knew you were capable of doing instead of hiding behind and using excuses. Cool. So what was that that you accomplished? So I tell people all the time, when I went back to school, it wasn't for basketball. It was to get my degree. And I went back in a matter of three years. I got two bachelor degrees, three minors, um, and graduated with summa cum laude, magnum cum laude, like president award winner, uh, the Entrepreneur Student of the Year Award. And that was in three years? Three years. After getting out of prison? After getting out of prison. Pedaling to go get the breathalyzer yes. test? Yes. Having to have curfew that you did never probably experience in high school. I mean, it, this was not, this was kind of like the Army. <laughs> oh, oh, it was. <laughs> yeah, this is not fluff and my life's all better. No, uh, people don't understand how hard I worked. I, I was driven to the point of it was almost making me sick. Mm -hmm. So during those three but years, you were on a new mission. I was on a mission, and my mission was to prove everybody wrong. And, and part of that was also to to finish for Bill. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, Bill was never not part of. No, this. The, that's all. That's that's the underlying. I, I have three things. I don't. Bill's like the biggest foundational piece, um, you know, of where my focus goes. So during that process, it was, I can't let God down and I can't let Bill down and I can't let my family down. Those are my three foundational pillars of everything that I do. And so when I went back to school to get those degrees, it was in a three year period, the two bachelor degrees and three minors. So I got my first bachelor degree in the, in the first two years I was there and I had a 3.75. But once you start setting goals and you have ambition, you don't want to settle. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was coming back that next year as an assistant coach at the university. And I said, well, I have leftover credits. What can I do to get another bachelor degree? And so we went through my whole thing, processed it all, and we said, if you take this, this, and this, we can get you a bachelor degree. So in one year, I got a second bachelor degree with three minors. I was in 12 to 24 and a half credits a trimester, so double full-time, while being a full-time college basketball coach. And then here's the kicker, I was working 40 hours a week. In uh, addition to in that? In addition to all that. I slept four hours a day, seven days a week, for seven years while I accomplished all that stuff. Three years for my two bachelor degrees, then I went and got my master's degree and coached college basketball. So during that, like, actually it was five years, during that five years, I slept four hours a day, seven days a week, out of every single day. And it was because I was working my tail off. I outworked every single person on that campus. When I showed up day one, basketball, school, I told everybody there that there's not gonna be one person that outworked me. There are people that are a heck of a lot smarter than me. I'm not that smart, but I was on a mission. I had purpose and I used my school and my basketball to to catapult myself into a whole nother realm of possibility. Like I was awarded the President's Award, which on our, is the highest award you sure. can get. Mm -hmm. And we um, have, it's called the Founders Award here, but yeah. it's, it's very similar. Yeah, and like only one person a year gets it, you know, that's, that's a big, the way this is. it's yeah, a big deal. They have the Founders deal. Daughter and the Founders Son Award, so oh. one woman and one man get Same. it, so yeah. So when I got the award, this is gonna tie it, I invited my parents. I said, hey, we got an award ceremony. They didn't know what it was. And then I get announced as, as president award winner. And my dad looks at me, and I'll never forget this. And he's like, what do I do? I've never cheered for you for academics or anything. He's like, is this basketball? What, what? He's like, I don't know what to say. Yeah. Because it was one of those moments he's never seen his son do something in academic that in, that, in that light. And for me, it was like, OK, I, I showed them I could do this and change and you know th that again is one of those memories that is just so important to me because I get this award for my grades mm -hmm. and it wasn't basketball it was my grades and my dad was like what do I do do I clap do I oh. 
it was, it was pretty cool. That's but very cool. I, I worked hard. I worked and really you continue hard. to work hard. Oh, yeah. And you continue to share your message across the country. And um, you have been um, now contacted by a major public publishing house, and you have signed a contract to basically write your memoir, correct? Yeah. Um, and will it have the same title, Undrafted Consequence? No. Um, so in the last couple of months, it's actually changed. Okay. okay. So instead of writing, I had 90,000 words for my memoir when I got my book publishing deal. And then I met with the editor mm -hmm. and decided to change it. So I've written a whole second book and I'm in the process of that. And it's my pillars, my five keys um, to success wrapped into five parts of a book that are about mental health, uh, that are about resiliency and desire and all these things that I've learned from a leadership standpoint. Now there's going to be memoir pieces in it, but now it's more of a, an all-encompassing, these are things that I use every day that can help you in your life and how you approach your life. So it's no Which longer. It makes total sense because it goes right along with your vision of yep. your story continuing to, to help yep. people and to yep. save people. Yep. So kudos to them for seeing that yeah. and for you for realizing that that was the direction it needed to go. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. So we've talked about a lot of stuff today. Yes, we have. And um, it's not easy. But thank you for trusting me and thank you for sharing your story. I do believe that as people watch this, they're going to maybe want to contact you or, or reach out to you. Uh, could you please provide us with your social media communication, your website, any yeah. place that someone would want to reach out and learn more about your yeah. story or maybe say, I am this person right now. Where do I start? Yeah. So... I've got two websites. Uh, Life Consequences is my nonprofit. So if you go to lifecon.org, um, that is where all the students uh, from middle school, high school, college students can reach out. Uh, students at lifecon.org is my private student email. So if anybody's struggling with something, I answer every single email I get. Um, you can go to ethan-fisher.com. And then my social media is efish.lifecon for Instagram. And those are basically my best places. And you can look Facebook, just type in Ethan Fisher. But um, use those websites if you want to get in contact with me. Uh, those are the best ways. And <clears throat> the coolest thing about my job, and we talked about it earlier, is the response I get from kids. Mm -hmm. They'll the, trust you because they get from what you're sharing yes. that you get it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So those letters and those contact information that I just did, when I get those letters, those are like priority. They make me. They make my whole entire life change. When I, I hear a, a letter from a student that said I didn't slip my wrist because of you, mm -hmm. and I treat every single one of those texts as if they were uh, a dear friend, mm -hmm. and I spend hours talking to people because they just want somebody to care. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the one thing. I will say this, I'm not a doctor or a lawyer. I can't prescribe you anything. I, I can't get you out of legal trouble. Um, and if you say something to harm yourself, I will report you. I've had to do it. I don't like to do it, but it's because I care. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that you're safe. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and obviously they're at a bottom, bottoming point where they need you to take that action, yeah. even if at the moment they don't understand that. No. Um, let's, let's use those, or let's say those, uh, websites one more time a little slower in okay. case someone's writing it down okay uh, lifecon.org l-i-f-e-c-o-n dot org um, and then students at lifecon.org and then ethan-fisher.com and that's a dash not an underscore yeah dash ethan um, dash yeah e-t-h-a-n dash fisher f-i-s-h-e-r dot com um, and then efish.lifecon for my Instagram and ethan.fisher uh, for Facebook. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for realizing at rock bottom that there was a way up and for choosing to climb up yeah. and for making a difference and uh, for Bill's life not going in vain.
Thank you for watching today's episode of the University of Finley Art and Culture Show. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, be well.